But, grandfather, asked Lawrence, were there no able and eloquent men in this country who took the part of King George? There were many men of talent, who said what they could in defense of the king's tyrannical proceedings, replied grandfather. But they had the worst side of the argument, and therefore seldom said anything worth remembering. Moreover their hearts were faint and feeble, for they felt that the people scorned and detested them. They had no friends, no defense, except in the bayonets of the British troops. A blight fell upon all their faculties, because they were contending against the rights of their own native land. What were the names of some of them? inquired Charlie. Governor Hutchinson, Chief Justice Oliver, Judge Akhmati, the Reverend Mather Biles, and several other clergymen, were among the most noted loyalists, answered Grandfather. I wish the people had tarred and feathered every man of them, cried Charlie. That wish is very wrong, Charlie, said Grandfather. You must not think that there was no integrity and honor, except among those who stood up for the freedom of America. For aught I know, there was quite as much of these qualities on one side as on the other. Do you see nothing admirable in a faithful adherence to an unpopular cause? Can you not respect that principle of loyalty, which made the royalists give up country, friends, fortune, everything, rather than be false to their king? It was a mistaken principle, but many of them cherished it honorably, and were martyrs to it. Oh, I was wrong, said Charlie, ingenuously. And I would risk my life, rather than one of those good old royalists should be tarred and feathered. The time is now come, when we may judge fairly of them, continued Grandfather. Be the good and true men among them honored, for they were as much our countrymen as the patriots were. And, thank heaven, our country need not be ashamed of her sons, of most of them, at least, whatever side they took in the revolutionary contest, among the portraits was one of King George III. Little Alice clapped her hands, and seemed pleased with the bluff good nature of his physiognomy. But Lawrence thought it strange, that a man with such a face, indicating hardly a common share of intellect, should have had influence enough on human affairs, to convulse the world with war. Grandfather observed, that this poor king had always appeared to him one of the most unfortunate persons that ever lived. He was so honest and conscientious, that, if he had been only a private man, his life would probably have been blameless and happy. But his was that worst of fortunes, to be placed in a station far beyond his abilities. And so, said Grandfather, his life, while he retained what intellect heaven had gifted him with, was one long mortification. At last, he grew crazed with care and trouble. For nearly twenty years, the monarch of England was confined as a madman. In his old age, too, God took away his eyesight, so that his royal palace was nothing to him but a dark, lonesome prison house. Chapter 7. Our old chair, resumed Grandfather, did not now stand in the midst of a gay circle of British officers. The troops, as I told you, had been removed to Castle William, immediately after the Boston Massacre. Still, however, there were many Tories, custom house officers, and Englishmen, who used to assemble in the British Coffee House, and talk over the affairs of the period. Matters grew worse and worse, and in 1773, the people did a deed, which incensed the king and ministry more than any of their former doings. Grandfather here described the affair, which is known by the name of the Boston Tea Party. The Americans, for some time past, had left off importing tea, on account of the oppressive tax. The East India Company, in London, had a large stock of tea on hand, which they had expected to sell to the Americans, but could find no market for it. But, after a while, the government persuaded this company of merchants to send the tea to America. How odd it is, observed Clara, that the liberties of America should have had anything to do with a cup of tea, grandfather smiled, and proceeded with his narrative. When the people of Boston heard that several cargoes of tea were coming across the Atlantic, they held a great many meetings at Faneuil Hall, in the Old South Church, and under Liberty Tree. In the midst of their debates, three ships arrived in the harbor with the tea on board. The people spent more than a fortnight in consulting what should be done. At last, on 16 December, 1773, they demanded of Governor Hutchinson, that he should immediately send the ships back to England. The governor replied that the ships must not leave the harbor, until the custom house duties upon the tea should be paid. Now, the payment of these duties was the very thing, against which the people had set their faces, because it was a tax, unjustly imposed upon America by the English government. Therefore, in the dusk of the evening, as soon as Governor Hutchinson's reply was received, an immense crowd hastened to Griffin's Wharf, where the tea ships lay. The place is now called Liverpool Wharf. When the crowd reached the wharf, said Grandfather, they saw that a set of wild-looking figures were already on board of the ships. You would have 
imagined that the Indian warriors, of old times, had come back again, for they wore the Indian dress, and had their faces covered with red and black paint, like the Indians, when they go to war. These grim figures hoisted the tea chests on the decks of the vessels, broke them open, and threw all the contents into the harbour. Grandfather, said little Alice, I suppose Indians don't love tea, else they would never waste it so, they were not real Indians, my child, answered Grandfather. They were white men, in disguise, because a heavy punishment would have been inflicted on them, if the king's officers had found who they were. But it was never known. From that day to this, though the matter has been talked of by all the world, nobody can tell the names of those Indian figures. Some people say that there were very famous men among them, who afterwards became governors and generals. Whether this be true, I cannot tell. When tidings of this bold deed were carried to England, King George was greatly enraged. Parliament immediately passed an act, by which all vessels were forbidden to take in or discharge their cargoes at the port of Boston. In this way, they expected to ruin all the merchants, and starve the poor people, by depriving them of employment. At the same time, another act was passed, taking away many rights and privileges which had been granted in the Charter of Massachusetts. Governor Hutchinson, soon afterward, was summoned to England, in order that he might give his advice about the management of American affairs. General Gage, an officer of the Old French War, and since commander-in-chief of the British forces in America, was appointed governor in his stead. One of his first acts, was to make Salem, instead of Boston, the metropolis of Massachusetts, by summoning the general court to meet there. 